Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really good to come and have the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I appreciate there's a bit of a, an imperative here because if you're saying that we're going to go to the pub as soon as this is over, then you want me to finish pretty rapidly. <laughs> so, uh, that's not a good start, really. And Duncan's already told me he's going to go to sleep in the middle of the lecture because the room's too warm. So uh, I've got a real incentive here to keep it lively and keep it short, I think, really. And so I shall certainly endeavour to do that. Um, I do want to cover um, quite a bit of, uh, of material, probably at quite a high level. Um, and that probably means I'll hopefully avoid any, um, uh, any areas where it's obvious I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I was a bit taken by the last speaker saying so that um, it was really obvious that the, the uh, academics didn't know anything about museums. And there's a danger you could say that to me later on, probably. Uh, so this is, this is quite high level. There's a lot of assertion, um, and uh, you, can, uh, you can call me about it later in the pub, perhaps, if you don't agree with some of the things I'm saying. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit um, and use this opportunity to talk a bit about how we big up archaeology. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, and I, that's, that is what I do in my job to a very large extent. Um, but it's a, got to be a collaborative exercise. No one individual can do it. No one organisation can do it. It has to be something where we all do it together. Um, but I think it's important, before we get too gloomy, uh, and I'm afraid at one or two points in this talk I will get a bit gloomy, so I apologise for that in advance, um, that we also think about where we've had successes, um, particularly perhaps if you go back over a slightly longer time frame, thinking back maybe sort of uh, 20, 30 years. Um, and, you know, this central question, you know, does, does archaeology matter? Um, well, you know, it, it matters to the extent that in the early 1990s, we managed to get the government of the day to agree that in PPG 16, um, and following through in various successes and national equivalents in other parts of the UK, Archaeology is firmly built into the planning process. Now, for some of you, you might think, what a bloody nightmare. Um, I'd actually quite like that tap turned off, please, because there's this material pouring out. I don't know what to do with it all. But it, I think in, you know, most people would argue that it's a, it was a great success that we got archaeology built into the planning process in that way. And that means now there are, you know, there's a whole industry, really, built around that opportunity for us to get in and advance the developments and try and get as much public benefit as we can from the archaeological um, uh, remains that are going to be uh, damaged or destroyed. Um, there are all sorts of other um, things you can argue as well, the successes on a more strategic level, uh, the fact that archaeology and heritage is part of things like strategic environmental assessments, environmental impact assessments. That's really important when you particularly start to look at some of these really big projects. Um, and you know, just thinking about some of the press we've seen around the archaeology on HS2, uh, which was uh, coming out last week, some of the excavations that are being undertaken there, for example, just that single one just up the road here at St Pancras, the cemetery there, that is costing tens of millions of pounds just to do that archaeological project. Um, and nobody really bats an eye. Uh, it, you know, that is just what you do um, as part of these sort of programmes of work. So I think that's, that has to be seen really um, as a real success. But if you go right back to how PPG 16 came about, did it really come about because archaeologists put a huge amount of pressure on the government? Or did it come about because of the Rose Theatre and the uh, public PR that came out of that site by a group of actors and, and, uh, and actresses? Um, they had, I suspect, as much to do with PPG 16 and the government wanting to deal with that problem um, as perhaps any archaeological advocacy that we'd undertaken um, over the period of time. And one of the things that I was found of interest to me when, when um, we were looking back over some of the early history of CBA, in the 1940s, one of the things the CBA was arguing for at that period, just at the, 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 the conclusion of the Second World War, was for a national archaeological service. And now, under the 30-year rule, we can see all the documents and what the civil servants were saying about that when we had meetings with them. And I, again, instructive to see that they absolutely accepted that that was the right thing to do. CBA won the argument that there should be a National Archaeological Service. But the government didn't do it because they didn't see enough pressure, particularly from the public, to make it happen. They didn't have to do it. Um, and so they didn't do it. Um, and we've let, uh, dealt with the consequences of that ever since. So I think there are two quite sort of instructive things right at the start in terms of um, uh, su some successes, but how we got them. Stonehenge is an issue um, that you've heard a lot about and you're going to hear an even more about um, in the next few months um, because the, uh, the public inquiry or public examination, strictly speaking, um, for the development consent order for the A303 road tunnel um, will be uh, kicking off uh, in the next few months. Um, 
My point really in putting this up and, and thinking of it as a success, and I'm not commenting on the, the present proposals for the road tunnel because we haven't seen them in detail yet, but you could argue that it's a success in terms of the, the, uh, the importance of heritage that the government has already paid to remove this road, the A344, and is proposing to spend shed loads of money, again, tens of millions of pounds, on a heritage scheme, not a road scheme, a heritage scheme, to remove the A303 from the majority of the World Heritage Site. Um, you know, I'm not getting into the pros and cons of that thing because it's, that's another talk in its own right, but, but it's interesting that the government is prepared to pay a lot of money at a time of you know, reasonable austerity um, to think about this as a heritage um, proposal. Also, over the last few years um, at Westminster, we've seen an interesting focus on the Britain's role in the protection of cultural heritage overseas. Um, you know, in the last year, we've at long last signed up to the Hague Convention uh, for what happens to um, try and uh, protect cultural heritage at times of armed conflict across the world, long overdue. Um, previous to that, we had the Dealing in Cultural Objects Offences Act. Um, that all links to the, the whole sort of concept of soft power and Britain still trying to project itself as a, as a power on the world stage. Sadly, it doesn't translate into heritage protection in this country. Um, although, if you look, for example, at what's happened in Wales and Scotland with their separate um, government systems, both of those countries have had relatively recent amendments to their historic environment legislation. We have no prospect of that in England at the moment. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, quite telling, I think, um, and shows that, again, some, what on the face of it could be quite modest changes, um, which would improve, streamline, update some of our, our, our practice um, and uh, delivery and, and enhance the public benefit. There's thought to be no prospect of that in the imminent future. That's not good. The key thing, though, and, and this is a slide which just attempts to sort of, as a, as a bit of a proxy for showing it, is we have huge public support, huge public enthusiasm um, for archaeology and heritage. Um, I was just picking out some things to try and show that. And the, the top picture, the black and white picture, is the cues of the Tutankhamun exhibition uh, in 1972. You know, we, we avoid these sort of things these days by having time ticketing and all these other things, because people don't like to queue very long. But it, it was a very good way of showing how much incredible interest there was. And actually, if you still look at things like the Staffordshire Board um, on the corner over there, you know, huge queues to see the Staffordshire Hoard in recent years. The Jorvik Centre in York um, opened in 1984. They've had over, um, they're getting off 20 million visitors during that time. And even now, since 1984, at certain times of the year, there are queues going right the way around Coppergate Square um, to go in there. So there is um, huge public enthusiasm and support for what we do. Um, and of course, it's not just through um, museum exhibitions. Um, we know from things like looking at the viewing figures for TV programmes. Um, you know, if you put a history um, archaeology programme on TV, you can be guaranteed to get at least a million, sometimes two to three million, um, if not more. Um, if you look at the statistics that the government produce, what's called the taking part statistics, you can see that going to take part in a, uh, in a heritage attraction or visit a museum or gallery is the most popular thing that people do right across the cultural and sporting domain. Far more people than go and watch football um, and things like that, for example. So we know and we can demonstrate that we have huge public support for what we do. There, there's enthusiasm for it. But of course, it's not all good news. Um, and just over a year ago, the British Academy um, produced a report um, which was really the work of a group of academics um, on, on the, with the title of Reflections on Archaeology. Um, and whilst in that report, and I'll, I'll sort of refer back to it several times during this talk, um, talked up the role of archaeology and talked up the impact of archaeology, they also felt that there were some real concerns about the way that archaeology is undertaken uh, right across the UK. Um, particularly, and it's sort of kind of encapsulated in this sentence, that one of their key conclusions, and in fact I think you could argue the only real conclusion they reached, um, was that they felt that the archaeology needs a single, more authoritative voice to speak <coughs> up for the discipline, um, because otherwise um, the discipline was under significant threat. Um, and how we do that and how we go about that is something I'll come on to um, in the second half of the talk. But it kind of indicates, and, and I think you know, there are a number of other um, um, sort of uh, issues cropping up which show 
we've got problems ahead and we need to be acting and thinking about how we act more collaboratively now. Um, so what are some of the issues that they were concerned about? What are some of the, the, the worries that they have? Yeah. Okay, you know, archaeology is still uh, in the planning system. Um, huge infrastructure projects coming down the track, um, road programs, other things. Are we really delivering enough public benefit from the archaeological work that goes on? Um, a lot of people would suggest the answer to that is no. Um, how could we justify um, and I appreciate it's an entirely subjective thing, but how would you justify the millions, if not billions, of pounds that have been spent on archaeology um, since PPG 16 and its equivalents came in? There's still a real focus on the discoveries aspect of it, the finds that come um, from the excavations, not necessarily the knowledge, the public engagement, um, that really is an absolutely critical part of that work. Um, and what we've seen over the last few years um, is that our position in the planning system is secure to the extent that within what's now the National Planning Policy Framework for England, there is a, a chapter on the historic environment. That's great. It's great that it has equivalence to the natural environment, which is, has a chapter two. We're not seen as the sort of uh, underneath that in any sense. That's all good. But successive um, governments over recent years have nibbled away at the planning system through successive reforms um, in an attempt to kickstart the housing, um, housing uh, bill that we, we need in this country. Now, we know that archaeology does not block housing. Um, we are part of the process. We are built in very well. Sensible developers know that if you get the archaeological work done in advance, it reduces the risks of the developers. It makes it a more attractive place. It gets more community engagement. It's a win-win it's a um, in most cases. But increasingly, what the government's trying to do um, is take things out of the planning system by extending permitted development rights, by stopping um, blockages, or perceived blockages, like pre-commencement conditions, um, other things like that, brownfield registers, all of which um, start to nibble away at the protection of archaeology and providing the opportunities for archaeologists to get in there. So there are some concerns about that side of things. We know, and it's frustrating to us all, um, that there's too much focus on treasure and on glittery things uh, and not on uh, enough on the things that actually give us understanding and knowledge. Uh, there's very little public understanding of the significance of context. Um, and that's a, that's a really important topic um, that we need to get a better public understanding of, it seems to me. Um, and of course, you know, again, we can no doubt argue in the pub later about whether the current system of treasure is a good one. And we all hope that in the very near future, and I think we might see it in the very near future, um, the government will do a review of the code of practice that links with the Treasure Act, which they should have done nearly 10 years ago now. And that will give us an opportunity to re-debate some of these questions about the definitions, etc., about the reward system and other things. But it, it is a problematic approach. Um, it does mean, uh, and I'm sure many of you are frustrated um, like we are, that there is no funding that comes through for the conservation work, for the acquisition, for the store, for the display, and yet you see a significant amount of, of uh, public money going to the owner and the finder when we didn't ask them to find it in the first place. There has to be a better approach, a better system. Um, and hopefully, um, if we do get a chance to, uh, to look at the Treasure Act again in some way, that will be a way of, of um, at least starting to think a little bit about how we could do it uh, a little bit better. We have a problem, it seems to me, with the image of archaeologists still. This is the Playmobil archaeologist. Um, how many of you have seen an archaeologist like that in your museum or on your site um, every day? Uh, not many, I suspect. Um, we need a better public understanding that archaeology is actually a really highly skilled, highly professional discipline. Um, and the people who do it have often, nearly always, got at least an undergraduate degree, nearly always a master's degree, and in many cases, even a PhD. Um, yet, it's so frustrating that when you see the portrayal of archaeology in the media, quite often they don't even use the word archaeologists. They call them historians uh, or scientists. Um, and uh, that's apparently to do with the fact that archaeology is a bit of a long word sometimes, so it's quite hard to fit into short columns in newspapers, which are a bit of nonsense, really. But the thing that really annoys me is when you see these headlines in the paper that archaeologists have stumbled across this latest <laughs> discovery. Uh, 
or you know, they, they happen by chance to have uncovered this amazing site, which actually, funnily enough, was on the HER, it was covered in the desktop evaluation, it was known about it through uh, previous work, and it was funded by the developer because they knew that was there before they had to go in there. So it was a highly professional activity, there was no stumbling involved, except perhaps at night when they're coming back from the pub. Um, so we need to change that impression. Um, and I think it's a critical role for CIFA, the, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, to, to get out there and persuade other professions about the equivalence that we have as archaeologists with the uh, professionalism uh, and dedication that many others show too. And of course you can extend this sort of public um, perception of what we are um, into other imagery um, and it's frustrating that for our discipline if you ask people in the streets, you know, who, could they name an archaeologist? you'll invariably get the names of fictional archaeologists, um, Lara Croft and, and Indiana Jones, etc. Um, you'll very rarely um, come across um, um, what people that perhaps we would know and respect um, from our profession. Um, and of course, you know, again, the, the sort of image that, that archaeology portrays in these, um, uh, these films and TV series, etc., nothing to do with what any of us would be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. So that, just, that goes along with this issue about the image of archaeologists. But you can flip that, and with many of these things, these things you, can, you, can, uh, you can flip them and say that part of this is because archaeology is thought to be exciting. It is thought to be a, 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 a discipline and a profession that people want to be. It's amazing how often you say to people, you know, they, they ask you, you, know, you, know, you come across somebody at a party and they say, what do you do? So, oh, I'm an archaeologist. Oh, I'd love to have been an archaeologist. I always wanted to be an archaeologist. And it's amazing how often people say that. So we have a, we have a sort of cachet and that I think we should make more of, perhaps, from that point of view. Um, we know that despite all the um, advantages that we've seen in legislation, you know, um, the, the Heritage Act going back to the late 19th century, um, scheduled ancient monuments, 20,000 plus of them uh, in England, <coughs> some of our nationally important sites are being damaged on a daily basis, um, destroyed in some cases. The, more, the, the Mars survey, Monuments at Risk survey in the 1990s, showed that um, agriculture alone had destroyed an archaeological site every single day since the Second World War in England. Um, and under the class consent system, um, even sites that are protected through scheduling, where there's been ongoing agricultural activity, that can continue. Um, and the only way to stop it is by enormous financial payouts, uh, which, not surprisingly, uh, the heritage agencies find hard to do. So it's a real sadness when you see pictures like this uh, from Somerset, um, where plowshares, this you know, round mosaic, literally just under the surface of the ground. Um, the uh, site had been ploughed for the first time, um, and instantly it had gone through a mosaic, and the, um, uh, the uh, tessery had started to come up. We also have a, an, an issue um, around land ownership um, and what that means. Um, and again, it's one of these very fundamental things that is a is sort of a it's, it's uh, regarded as a, as a right, almost, under our legislation. It's very different in many other countries around the world, indeed many other countries in Europe, where the state owns things. Um, in the majority of the UK, anything that's found under the ground is the property of the landowner, and therefore the landowner, um, with the, who's the perhaps uh, occasionally ill-advised, can allow things like metal detecting rallies on their land right up to the boundary of a scheduled ancient monument. Um, where you know that there's going to be uh, other sites, other finds within the, the setting of that monument. Um, but because the landowner rights are seen as, as so fundamental, um, that's another audience that we really have to try and um, talk to um, and help them to understand that this sort of event is hugely damaging um, for archaeology and, and heritage uh, and the public benefit that comes from it. And of course you can contrast that with the, um, the more, um, more responsible attitude that some detectorists have working with the Port of Antiquities Scheme, following the responsible code for uh, metal detecting, uh, which is uh, helping us to understand and tell stories and provide uh, an amazing knowledge base uh, for students to look at uh, and do further research with. The other concern, um, before I move on and talk about a uh, bit more positive, um, is um, inevitably um, we have had to take our share um, to some extent of the public austerity cuts in recent years. So much of what we do, so much of the position of archaeology in the planning system is dependent on key posts within the local planning authorities. 
the archaeological advisor posts and the historic environment records and the officers that run those posts, the, the service that goes with it. And it's not just about servicing planning, it's also about providing the information to, um, to landowners and farmers linked to agri-environment schemes. Ideally, it's about public engagement and outreach as well. Um, but we know, and we've got the figures, um, that the number of um, those posts has diminished significantly uh, by over a third um, in the last 10 years or so, and nobody quite knows what's going to happen next. You know, we're all slightly fearing the scenario uh, where local authorities in England have to be self-financing by 2020. Um, the cost of adult social welfare, adult health costs is rising and rising. Um, those are statutory obligations on local authorities. Understandably, they're focusing on statutory obligations. Archaeology, it's in policy, it's in the national policy framework. Is that legislation, does that still have to happen? Um, there are a number of authorities that I think are trying to uh, suggest and trying to act as if it doesn't. Um, so one of our worries um, is the whole system. It could be a bit of a deck of cards built on these posts uh, and they may not be there. So and yet another reason why um, we have to big up archaeology now um, more perhaps than ever. We know though, and this is a couple of paragraphs taken from that British Academy Reflections report, um, that archaeology has so much to offer modern society. And it's not just about <coughs> stories and knowledge and understanding of the past. It's absolutely relevant to today, to tomorrow, and to our longer term future. It's about understanding human behavior. It's about understanding people. It's about understanding the environment and our impact on the environment. Many of these really, really key topics for us as a society, um, like um, identity, um, climate change, uh, inequality, migration, things that you effectively can't get away from in the news. Every time you turn on the news or read a newspaper, those are the topics that are currently being discussed. We as archaeologists have got things to say, got things to contribute to those discussions. But how often do you hear our voice? How often do you hear our perspective in those places? Very, very rarely. Um, and that, to me, is one of the key things we need to think a little bit more about, is how do we get our voice into those national debates, into the media, not just in the old stereotypical ways that the media like to um, pigeonhole us in, but into some of these discussions and some of these debates. One of the concerns that some of the academics have at universities, looking at recruitment numbers, which have been going down steadily in archaeology, and interestingly, looking at that against anthropology. Uh, anthropology um, recruitment numbers are going up, um, and there's been some work done to try and understand what that, why that is. Um, and it's interesting that one of the things that's come out of that is that students think that anthropology is about big questions, big issues about humanity. And archaeology is seen as a very technical, vocational subject. Uh, whereas, in fact, we all know that that's far from the truth and that we work very closely with anthropologists um, and we have just as much a contribution to make some of those big issues um, as they do. Um, and, you know, you couldn't really envisage a topic um, more um, than uh, identity uh, and the issues that that's associated with at the moment in relation to Brexit. Um, this idea um, that we're going to cut ourselves off from Europe, that we're going to become um, a sort of racially pure, ethnically undiverse uh, culture uh, is a complete fabrication, uh, as we all know. Um, I thought this was a fantastic poster from one of the uh, demonstrations a few, uh, I think maybe last year. Um, archaeology you know, is political. Um, we have to get involved in these debates. You know, where people don't understand, I'm afraid, that it's not that long ago, only a few thousand years ago, that we were not an island. People could walk freely from what is now continental Europe um, to what is now uh, southeast England and back again. Um, there are all sorts of um, interesting cultural issues that we need to be thinking about and, and getting involved in. But of course, Brexit has the potential, particularly under a no-deal scenario, to have enormously damaging implications for archaeology as well as many other aspects of society. Um, and just to take two uh, very quickly at this point, um, migration um, and the issues associated with migration post-Brexit, um, um, there seems to be a suggestion at the moment um, that only people will be, only migrant workers will be allowed in if they're appropriately skilled. But nobody can work out how to define appropriately skilled. So as a proxy for that, we're talking about salary levels. 
Um, now we know that salary levels in our um, disciplines, and the same, I'm afraid, uh, is the same case abroad, they're not very high, and they're not as high as they should be for the skill that we have. So we're not going to meet the thresholds. So at the moment, um, under HS2 and under some of the other big infrastructure schemes, a very significant proportion of the archaeologists working on those sites are not UK archaeologists. They are archaeologists coming in from Europe and other parts of the world. They may not be able to come in in the future um, if that system is taken forward. So we have real concerns about some of those things um, and about some of the policies um, that go with it. For example, the common agricultural policy has to be brought into UK legislation and policy. Will the protections that we've enjoyed um, come through? That's another key topic for us in terms of our advocacy um, over the coming um, months, indeed weeks. So how are we going to do all that? How are we going to um, go out there and get our voice heard? Who's going to do it for us? If you go back a few years, um, we had archaeologists who were known household names. Two years in a row in the mid-1950s, archaeologists were TV personality of the year. You could perhaps understand that for Morton Wheeler, but I find it more difficult to understand for Glyn Daniel, um, who wasn't quite the sort of um, bon viveur that, uh, that Morton Wheeler clearly was. Um, but through programmes like Animal Vegetable, Vegetable Mineral and some of the other programmes that came around at the time, archaeology uh, had an opportunity to get its voice across um, to an enormous audience um, in that period. More recently, um, we've obviously had a whole range of TV programmes, Time Team, Meet the Ancestors, Blood of the Vikings, all those sorts of things. Um, there was a really interesting debate a couple of weeks ago at another conference I was at as to whether the problem for us in more recent years is that we've lost the opportunity for archaeologists to talk, to, um, to use mass media um, to, to reach out, and whether it's uh, been a negative that we've gone, we've started to use professional communicators, by which you can include people like Tony Robinson and uh, Alice Roberts uh, and people like that, Dan Snow, um, who are uh, who are not archaeologists but front up these programmes. Um, and uh, there was a very interesting discussion about that. And, and actually, I, I tend to think the conclusion of the discussion, and in my own view, is that if somebody's a good communicator, they can communicate anything. They don't have to be an archaeologist to communicate archaeology well. But equally, an archaeologist can be an appalling. Um, doesn't necessarily go one way or the other. But what we must have, and what we do need, are strong communicators um, to get across and use the media that exist. If you type into Google, um, TV programmes Archaeology UK, these are the five that come up as the top five programmes. Um, two of them are, are, are complete nonsense, two of them are appalling nonsense, um, and one of them's time tin, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> That's not a very good sign for people who uh, are coming and, and, uh, you know, and perhaps thinking that I want to know more about what archaeology is, how can I find out more about it? Um, if that's the sort of um, choice that they're given. Um, obviously, the key thing for us nowadays um, is that it's not just about television. There are so many more ways in which we can get across and use mass media. I'm really interested to see how um, Dan Snow's History Hits TV channel which is he's setting out to be effectively the sort of the Netflix for history and archaeology. Um, he's already got a significant subscriber base. You know, it's, it's the same sort of business model as Netflix. You, you pay five or six pound a month. You get access to a huge range of content exclusively about history and archaeology. We need to be supporting initiatives like that to get across better quality content and informed content um, to educate the public more about what the opportunities are for them to get involved. But of course, all of you have a really, really important opportunity as well in terms of what you do. You are the front face, you are the front line in many cases between the public uh, and, and archaeological material. And providing that opportunity for the public to access that material in either a hands-on way or through displays, exhibitions, etc., is absolutely critical. Um, and we can't essentially get enough of it, it seems to me. But if we can't rely on, um, on uh, rubbish TV um, and uh, aliens to come to our, uh, our aid, what about people within our own um, profession and our own discipline um, who are perhaps the figures that we would be thinking would be the people who'd be speaking up on our behalf? Who are our leaders um, within, uh, within archaeology? I'm not quite sure how you measure that. So I thought, well, there's a couple of ways you could um, argue in terms of status. 
Um, so clearly, if you're a peer at the realm, uh, Lord Colin Renfrew, um, he's been given the opportunity to speak um, and to um, create legislation. Um, he's the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Archaeology Group. He is clearly an influential person and an influential voice. Um, Dame Rosemary Cramp and uh, Sir Barry Cunliffe um, are our other two individuals who have been um, knighted in that sense um, through the National Honours System. Um, we have passionate advocates like Tim Shadler Hall, um, and uh, I always think of Tim when I come and talk at these audiences. And uh, saw him the other day, and he's not doing too great at the moment, but uh, he's, uh, he's been a long standing um, voice and uh, champion for archaeology, heritage, <coughs> and museums. Um, but are these the right people? Are they getting the messages across? Now, where is the voice of everybody else? How do we get our voice heard in some of these um, places, in some of these fora? And critically to me, um, one of the key issues is where are the academics? Where are the university um, staff? Their jobs um, are as pressured, if not more pressured, than almost everybody else. Um, yeah, nobody should think that being an academic um, uh, lecturer is, is in any way an easy task. Um, but traditionally, they were the people um, who spoke out about um, big thinking uh, in archaeology. Um, and I think we've um, perhaps got into a situation more recently where we have fewer people um, from, uh, from the universities standing up and speaking, particularly appearing on, on things like Newsnight. The CBA gets a lot of phone calls from the media um, wanting us to put up speakers to appear on various uh, media platforms, um, normally linked to some story that's come out during the day. And you have to act quickly and you have to find somebody who can go and be authoritative and come across well on, on TV. Uh, it's, I have to tell you, it's very difficult to find people who are prepared to do that in archaeology. Quite often people have a, quite a handy excuse as to why they can't do it, or they just don't answer the phone or they don't reply to your emails. Um, people are, are more reticent about putting their, their heads above the parapet and speaking out. Um, and I think that's a shame. I think more people need to take more responsibility um, to get out there and, and do those things. Um, but of course, you know, the, the universities are looking at a cliff edge too. Um, their cliff edge um, is, uh, is funding for research. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen these, um, these figures, but the European Research Council funding, ERC, which is one of the biggest pots of money that researchers can get um, in Europe. We in the UK have been incredibly successful. This is the, this is the UK being successful against all these other countries over the last um, eight or nine years. And then within um, the UK, um, archaeology has been incredibly successful. Um, the blue columns are the total pot um, for archaeology, um, and the red columns are how much of those have come to archaeology in the UK. So we've, we've gotten probably more than our fair share in that sense. And so these sums of money have been really, really important for big research <coughs> programs um, at UK um, institutions. Again, post-Brexit, that tap will be turned off. There is no indication at the moment that the UK government is going to replace that tap. Um, and, um, and clearly... Yeah, that's a major concern too. So one of the scenarios, or the sort of kind of doomsday scenario, um, is that we'll go back to how archaeology was perhaps in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And there'll be far fewer um, opportunities to study archaeology at university. There'll be almost no large um, contracting operations. And we'll be back to relatively small scale, um, often community run um, projects. That's the absolute doomsday scenario that we have to avoid. Um, but I don't personally think for one minute that we're going to end up there. I think we've got far too much public support, and I think we're too embedded, um, although that's not to say there are not going to be huge challenges. So what we need to do is to harness the energy and the enthusiasm and the connections that we have. But it's not straightforward. And you go back to the British Academy report that said we need this single voice, the single authoritative voice for archaeology in the UK. Now you won't be able to see the detail of this, and in some ways that's not the point. This is a Venn diagram uh, which one of my colleagues, Rob Lennox, put together for his PhD research, trying to look at some of the national organisations in the heritage sector in England, and how they interact and, and link with each other. Um, and you have all these different umbrella bodies. So for example, you've got the Historic Environment Forum, which is a, a grouping of various organisations that come together. That's this circle here. You have the Archaeology Forum that Gail talked about. That's this circle here. 
you have members of the Heritage Alliance. That's this big circle here. You have the Joint Committee of National Amenity Societies. That's this circle here. Now, the interesting thing that comes out of that, when you put them all together, is the organisation that's actually at the centre um, of all that Venn diagram is the Council of British Archaeology. And one of our key strengths is the fact that we are in all those places. We are able to make those connections. We are able to network across and understand that some of the discussions that are going on over here are actually relevant to the discussions that are going on over here. And it does mean that we're able to get into and, and kind of at times muscle into some key um, advocacy opportunities, for example, meetings with ministers. Um, the Historic Environment Forum um, provides a, a pool of people um, who meet with um, the Heritage Minister in England on a, on a regular basis, um, and we can get access through that channel. The Archaeology Forum has had regular meetings with Heritage Ministers over the years, um, and that, those are important channels too. They're not the only channels, but they are, they are important ones. But this, I'm afraid, uh, might look to you like a bit of a dog's breakfast. This is only the, the, the tip of the iceberg. I can't, I can't show you anything like a map for England um, because there are so many organisations. It's a little bit simpler in Scotland and Wales, but even this map, which has been um, charged, has been put together for Scotland, trying to show you all the different organisations involved in heritage and archaeology in Scotland, of which all of these purple ones here are doing national advocacy. Now, if you're a minister um, or a, a, an opinion former or a civil servant, you don't have time to, to go and talk to and listen to all of these different organisations. You want uh, a, an authoritative single voice that is representative. And it was very interesting. I was at a, a, a breakfast meeting. Part of, part of the problem with dealing with politicians is, is the old John Knott phrase that they're here today, gone tomorrow. They often get shuffled on. When um, Sajid Javed was culture secretary a few years ago, we were at a breakfast meeting with him. And he said, OK, he said, realistically, um, I've probably got a year in this post before I'm reshuffled or moved. He said, I, in that year, as part of my portfolio for um, DCMS, I can probably do one key thing for the heritage sector. So you, what you have to do is tell me, together, what is that one key thing you would all support, and then I'll try and do it for you. Uh, but he said, if you try and come to me and tell me there are ten things, or you, tell, or you over there tell me one thing and you over there the other, you probably will get nothing. Um, and I thought that was, a, that was an important and, and quite telling statement. We need to be speaking much more together. We need to be coming together um, and speaking with one voice. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that we need to be one organisation. Um, and I think that's where I would differ from the conclusions of the British Academy report. I don't think there's any realistic prospect that all of the organisations are going to merge into a single organisation. And I think, to be honest, the amount of, of uh, disruption that that would cause and the amount of difficulty that would create for some time um, would probably mean it was almost impossible to do. But we do have, within archaeology, um, the Archaeology Forum, which is a UK-wide delegate body. Most of the key national advocacy organisations are members of it, including the SMA, and Gail's done a fantastic job at representing your, your cause in recent years. Um, it is a place where we can have um, a, a cross-dialogue um, try and make sure that we're aligning our policy objectives. We, we do things in different ways. You know, we have different um, uh, routes to influence. But the key thing is that we're talking about shared priorities. And we're not, the, the politicians and the opinion formers that are hearing our voice <coughs> are not hearing mixed messages. Because um, that is a recipe for getting nothing. Um, and the Archaeology Forum, the other key thing that it does, it provides the secretariat for the all-party parliamentary archaeology group at Westminster. Um, now, yeah, again, it's a complicated world these days. That's only Westminster. That's really only English um, legislation and policy, some UK-wide policy. Um, really, we need an equivalent to APAG uh, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, and colleagues up there do a, do a great job in trying to do that in a, in a slightly different sort of way. Um, but APAG, for us, has been a really, really important um, uh, creation over the last 15 or so years. Um, it's not something that you hear a great deal about in public, um, because partly that's not how it works. Um, I'm, I'm the secretary to APAG. Um, it, they, they meet uh, normally every other month um, as a group. But again, it's a channel through which we can do things, through which we can access ministers, through which we can get parliamentary questions asked, put down topics for debate, put down amendments to legislation. It's really, really crucial to us to provide that opportunity. Um, 
and uh, something I think we need to do to take uh, take more from. Um, another challenge we have um, is that archaeology obviously is only part of the historic environment sector, which in a sense is only part of the heritage sector. Um, and how we as archaeologists get our voice heard in some of these broader um, channels and, and, uh, and, and groups um, is, is, to me, is another key thing. Heritage 2020 is, is an English um, uh, collaborative initiative, um, which I've, I've been leading over the last three and a half years. Um, it followed on from the, um, the originally what was English Heritage's uh, National Heritage Protection Programme. What we've tried to do with Heritage 2020 is not to cover everything that the sector does, but to focus on a small number of priorities that were shared priorities where there were benefits through collaboration. There was more that we could achieve by working together than we could in isolation. And we've tried to do that through five groups, five working groups. And each of those working groups has a range of members, some from the heritage sector, some from outside the heritage sector, where they bring specific extra connections and skills. Um, and we've tried to focus on some of the key issues. The problem, though, is that the initiative itself is not, is not a funded initiative. It's not an initiative where there's, there's you know, shed loads of money that we can just um, roll out. Um, the organisations that are part of the initiative have to bring their own resources together. And we have to see what we can do um, and how much more we can get out of that, uh, that collaboration and, and that, uh, that working together. But the, the idea, and the reason it's sort of presented in this way, um, is that we've got three um, sort of core groups, which are sort of wrapped around by two groups, of which the key one, from our point of view, um, is helping things to happen, which is trying to um, steer together the advocacy that we're doing right across the heritage sector. Um, and again, we now have a, um, an opportunity to do that. And we have a heritage council in England, which is not just about talking to the heritage minister, because one of the problems we have is that when we're talking to the Heritage Minister, they often say the, the, the easy get out for them is, well, actually, I'm sorry, but it's not really my responsibility. What we really need to be doing is going talking to Secretary of State for Agriculture or Secretary of State for Housing um, or Secretary of State for Defence. Um, and so the Heritage Council is an attempt to try and bring together some of those other ministries um, at a high level. That strategic approach, though, is, is, is critical to it. And again, it's interesting to see, you know, we had a, uh, heard mentioned this before, and we all have to mention Scotland, Scotland's archaeology strategy. Um, there isn't an equivalent in England. Um, there's a, an Irish version, which is actually looking way ahead. They're already starting work on the 2030 version uh, in Ireland. Um, and then, of course, you get occasional reviews, like the Mendoza review recently, it's very relevant to you. Um, in the near future, we're going to get um, a review of Historic England and English Heritage um, since the split um, three years ago. We've just had a big review of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, we need to be getting in and influencing these strategies, these reviews, um, to make sure that they're, they're forward-looking um, and that they provide the evidence base um, on which to base many of the asks that we have. And when we have those asks, we have to engage with politicians at all levels. I get the chance to talk to the Heritage Minister on a regular basis. Um, the best engagement I've ever had, um, going back over at least 15 years now, was with David Lammy, uh, when he was the Culture Minister um, under the Labour government. We didn't just get <coughs> David to come out and look at excavations, and this was a, a Museum of London project at Shoreditch. We actually got him uh, out on his hands and knees excavating. Um, and this made such an impact that when, um, when the next year came around and there was a further opportunity, and by that stage he'd been moved on, and Margaret Hodge was the culture minister, um, she said that she'd be happy to come along and meet and do an event linked to the Festival of Archaeology, but under no circumstances was she going to go on her knees and get dirty. Um, that was her one stipulation. So we had to take her to the Museum of London to look at a, a, a mosaic, I think it was. Um, but we have to be engaging with these people. But the key thing is, it's not just about the ministers, it's about all politicians. Who knows when the, the, your local MP is going to be a member of the government? And at the moment, they go through them at a rate of knots, so it could be quite soon. Um, everybody should be going along to constituency surgery. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> um, everybody should be going along to constituency surgeries and explaining to local MPs, and not just MPs, also councillors, your local ward councillors, 
why archaeology matters to you, why it's important, how it's protected in the systems, where the limited funding goes and why that's critical. We need to get a better informed understanding amongst our politicians that actually archaeology is a good news story, it's a, it's a public benefit, um, and often it's actually not even funded from the public purse anyway. A lot of the money comes from other sources. So that's really critical. Um, and it seems to me that the only way that we're really going to succeed in this endeavour is because we are quite a small group. Um, there's only something like five and a half, six thousand people who earn their living from archaeology. We need to demonstrate the public support. And one of the um, members of the parliamentary group um, a few weeks ago was talking, and, I, and I, he, he used a phrase which I thought was really important. Um, he said, what we need to be doing is fostering a, a climate of public opinion that's favourable to us. Um, and that will mean that we get fewer cuts further down the line and we get more opportunities. And we know that there is amazing support out there for what we do. This is a group who go out on Dartmoor um, month in, month out, recording all sorts of uh, prehistoric stone lines, statues, cairns, um, in all sorts of weathers. They love it, not just because of what it offers them in terms of the archaeology and the history, but because they enjoy the activity, they enjoy the comradeship, it's got health benefits, all these other things that are, that are good and important. Um, so we know that we've got that support. We know that where there are threats to heritage, so for example, the allocation of, um, of a, an area for housing right next to Osselbury Hill Fort in Shropshire, the group that come out and hug their hill fort every year on Valentine's Day. Um, that has created a huge, again, in, in that local area, almost everybody knows about that campaign. They all know about Osselbury Hill Fort. They all know why it's important. Um, and many of them um, support the campaign um, and push forward. And that is ultimately what is going to um, influence public opinion. But it's not because we're against things. It's not because we're trying to stop change. It's because we want to and help people to understand that it's all about change. Change is inevitable. Um, and that's what we know as archaeologists. So a lot of this is about providing that positive message about we can learn from the past, perhaps to avoid making some of those mistakes in the future. And we have a, a role to play, I think, in, in supporting uh, some of that activity. CBA's had its um, local heritage engagement network, LHEN project, Esme Fairburn Foundation funded over recent years. There's a whole toolkit of material with briefing notes, um, advice documents. We're trying to spread this message out through our regional groups and through local societies, get them all involved, get them um, up, and, and, uh, up and running in terms of doing advocacy. But it's, it, it isn't always easy, and there's no point pretending it is. For many people, particularly if you go along and talk to local archaeological societies, their real interest is the local archaeology. They're far more reticent about getting involved in, in political advocacy and campaigning. Um, and, and part of what we have to do is explain why they won't get, I'm afraid, the archaeology if they don't do some of this uh, in the future. Uh, and when I think you explain <coughs> it, you, you explain that it's not about party politics, it's about just promoting the value and the perceptions of archaeology. People do get it. And we have got great stories to tell, but ultimately, uh, and just the last couple of slides, I just wanted to refocus on why we do this. And for me, um, yes, of course, knowledge is always going to be at the, the bedrock of what we do. We are, we're a knowledge discipline, but we're a people discipline too. And when you see some of the benefits um, to the, the military veterans through the Operation Nightingale program and some of the other things who've come out and from having had um, service in, in horrendous um, conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that, um, and the rehabilitation that has been enabled through their engagement with archaeology, and the military doctors who are quite clear that that is uh, something they were astonished to see would never have been achieved through traditional sort of medical approaches. And it's something which our discipline can really give back to some people um, who've given so much um, for us. And I do think that the absolutely critical thing, and it goes back a little bit to what Ellen was talking about earlier on in Birmingham, about the fact that we are a very um, diverse country. We're getting more diverse all the time. The, this whole concept of identity is, is breaking down. Um, we are living in a, in a very multicultural world. And that appeals, has appeal to everybody. Um, everybody is interested in where they live, where they work, where that's come from. And you see that more than ever. Um, when you work with the kids. 
And, it, and I, I, the, the sort of last thing I wanted to leave you with, really, is from my point of view, I think one of the most important things that we can do alongside the advocacy we can all be involved with is to, is to uh, educate the next generation of young archaeologists coming through. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're going to go off and be archaeologists. And in some ways, you know, the ideal scenario is that somebody comes through the Young Archaeologist Club and in due course becomes somebody of huge influence. Um, and that will be just as good in some ways uh, as training up somebody who can be a professional archaeologist. We have a whole range of opportunities um, for the Young Archaeologist Club um, with branches um, around the country. We have nearly 80 branches around the country. It would be fantastic if more museums could run branches in the Young Archaeologist Club. Um, it provides sustained opportunities for young people between 8 and 16. And we're working at the moment with a whole range of other groups. Some of you may have seen we've just got the Girl Guiding Movement to have an archaeology badge using some of the resources we developed through the Young Archaeologist Club. We're working on a programme at the moment to keep that engagement going beyond 16, from 16 to 25, and provide more opportunities. That is another core purpose area for CBA um, moving forward. And I hope it's one that um, you'll be willing to support further in the museum sector. And if anybody wants to talk about that, then yeah, again, please do, uh, and follow me through uh, afterwards. So that was very much a whistle-stop tour. I appreciate I've covered a huge amount of ground in that. Um, hopefully it's given you some food for thought. I'm very happy to um, talk about it afterwards. But I'm very grateful to you all for not falling asleep, in Duncan's case, and uh, keeping awake. And I'm very sorry that you missed the fireworks, but there you go, there's at least some. <laughs> Thank you very much.